In this tutorial, we'll be looking at a few more good design practice when we are writing embedded software. So in the previous video, I have already discussed one good design practice is you represent your hardware as structures. We write structured programs, hierarchical programs. That means you have header files and corresponding source files for each peripheral. And in the main code, you include the header file from that peripheral and use the APIs available from that. For this demo, I'm going to use the same example of DAC, uh, which I have shown in the previous tutorial. So there our aim is to use the DAC inside LPC 2378 and create a sine wave. And the sampling period of that sine wave, we are controlling using the match mode of a timer. And we are using interrupt service routine to get an interrupt whenever the match happens. and generate the value for the uh, sine wave at that sampling instance. Now I have rewritten my code uh, almost entirely. Actually, I have restructured it uh, by following our good design practice, which I mentioned before. So now you can see the code is much more readable. We can easily see what is happening. So first I am initializing my DSE, then I am initializing the timer, then I am configuring my timer, then I am initializing the vector interrupt controller. I am configuring the vector interrupt controller saying like I need an interrupt on timer zero. Uh, here again, I am setting the priority for timer zero interrupt. Here I am linking my timer zero with the corresponding interrupt service routine uh, for that. Then I am resetting my timer. I am starting my timer. I am waiting in the while loop. And here is my interrupt service routine. So this makes our program uh, much more readable. If someone else is checking your code, it is much easier for them to read. And also later, even when you yourself want to debug something, uh, writing readable code makes debugging much more easier. And this is quite intuitive also. For example, here, if you see, I'm calling configure timer and you can see the parameters I'm passing. I'm passing a timer uh, structure variable and I'm saying like in which mode I want to configure. I'm saying I need match zero. I'm also passing the match value at which the matching should be done. I'm saying interrupt should be enabled. Uh, reset on match should be enabled and stop on match should be disabled. Again, this is more intuitive instead of you passing like one zero one or something like that. Uh, when you do like that, okay, your code will still work but it won't be much intuitive. So instead of using those hard values, if you use uh, these kind of data types, uh, life will be much easier. Okay, so let me go through my timer code once again, and let me say what modifications I have made. So first and foremost, whenever you write APIs, the functions which will be used by application program. Okay, so this is the driver for the timer, the low level program. Uh, whenever you write a function, uh, make it a habit always to write uh, this kind of comments at the beginning of each function. So if any professional code you look, uh, they always write this comment at the beginning, which will basically say what this function does, what are the parameters that you are passing to the function, uh, what are the return value of this function. For example, I'm saying like this function is for initializing the timer, I'm passing the timer instance and the timer number as the parameters and the function returns success if it can successfully initialize the timer and it will return fail if the timer number that you specified here is invalid. So basically you have timer 0, 1, 2, 3. So if the user gives the so application software developer, if he gives any value other than this, it should return an error. So another change that I have made is previously I was always returning 0 on success and returning minus one whenever it was failing. So I have modified those constants also. Okay? Because uh, again, when you write application software, uh, you will be always checking the return value after calling each API. For example, here you can see in case of timer, I'm checking init timer and I'm checking whether status is zero or not. So it is possible you may have different error condition. Uh, here itself, as I mentioned, when I'm initializing the timer, one error condition that can happen is the timer uh, number specified is wrong. But if I look at, say, some other function, for example, 
this is the function to configure the timer to a particular mode and as of now i am supporting only match 0 and match 1 so if the application software says any other condition uh, i will return like error happened but it is better if you tell the application software exactly what is the error now if somebody is uh, writing this application software and if this error happens they cannot come to the source code and read it okay it's very inconvenient so what we can do is all those error codes you can directly write into the header file so here you can see i have given the error code so i'm saying like success status it is zero invalid timer number is minus one timer not initialized is minus two invalid mode is minus three so these are the different error conditions that can happen so when you write the application software it can check the return value and if it is not zero that means uh, something went wrong and by looking at the return value he can exactly find out what is the error also so that's the advantage okay so this is a, a good coding style now another thing i added here is previously when i wrote the apis for timer okay after init timer when i wrote this start and stop i wrote the mass void and i said like okay i don't find any condition where any error can happen okay so in some sense that is true you can always start or stop a timer but what may happen is again you cannot expect the application software developer to always call this init function before calling this one okay suppose he forgot to call this function so if he forgot to call this function the base address of the timer uh, wouldn't have been configured in that case if he directly called this start the base address will have some garbage value and you are actually writing to some garbage address okay so things won't be working so here what i'm making sure is application software can call any of these apis only after calling this init timer for that what i have done is i have made a new member inside my structure called initialized and in the timer initialization function i am setting that variable to one okay otherwise its value could be zero or some random value uh, the probability of it becoming one is almost zero okay so there i am making it one so in all other apis first i am checking whether the timer is initialized if it is not initialized i will immediately return an error timer not initialized error uh, which is basically minus two so the application uh, software when somebody is testing if error is happening they can immediately find okay i haven't called this function that's why this error is happening so that is the second modification which is being added now next modification is okay last time we used this function reg write and reg read and i said like these are like local function uh, there is no need to expose it to the external world so i won't add them to the header file i just keep them inside now it is possible that you may have these kind of local functions uh, inside the driver of multiple peripherals. Uh, now the problem is when you compile it, uh, there won't be an issue. But when you link it, when the linker comes and he tries to link all these source codes together to make the executable, he will find same function name in multiple object files. And that will create issue. Okay. So you want to make sure this function is visible only within this C file. So that even if there is a function called reg write, say inside the interrupt controller, that function has nothing to do with this function. They are treated as separate function. To do that, we add this qualifier static in front of the function declaration. So all these local functions uh, that you are using within the driver, uh, better to prefix static there so that it won't cause issues uh, during link so basically these are the differences i have made uh, one more thing that you can see here is i am making advantage of some of the boolean operations also so this also you may find again and again for example here i have the function uh, reset timer so remember whenever i want to reset the timer the timer enable bit should be also set and the reset bit should be also set so here if you see uh, i have those corresponding bit patterns available here so start timer set is all zeros uh, one at the end reset timer is 
or zero, but only the penultimate bit is one. So for resetting, what I actually need is I want both lower bits to be uh, one, one. So in that case, okay, you can have a separate case uh, where you have value three and you can use it there, but it makes more logic if I say like my reset condition is this bit pattern odd with this bit pattern. Okay, this is very useful and we'll be repeatedly using it uh, especially when the bit patterns are one hot encoder. Okay, so one hot encoder means in a binary number you have only one bit as one, everything else as zero. That's what we call as one hot. So this timer set is one hot because you have zero bit as one and reset this is also one hot because you have only first bit as one. So when you OR these one hot uh, bit patterns you get multiple bit set uh, corresponding to where there is one in each of this number. Okay, so that's what is being used there. So again, uh, using these Boolean operations for efficient implementation, you will be seeing again and again. Another one here you can see in match mode. Okay, uh, so you can see I need to configure the interrupt bit, reset bit, and stop bit inside the match control register. Okay, so the order is rightmost is interrupt, followed by reset, then followed by stop. So what should be the values there is actually given by the application software. Now I need to set those corresponding values there. Okay, so the easiest one is if I do something like this, lowermost is interrupt, okay, whatever value is given by application software, uh, that number comes there. I'm ORing it with whatever value is given for reset, left shifted by one. Okay, so effectively what happens is you will have the interrupt bit here and the bit left to it will correspond to whatever bit is here. Then the third one is stop. I am left shifting it by two position and ORing with this entire thing. Okay, so if you look at that bit pattern, it will correspond to stop, reset, interrupt. And that is what is getting written into the offset register. Now an additional thing uh, that I have seen is I mentioned uh, in the main also it makes more intuitive if you use uh, these kind of data types instead of using zeros and ones directly. So here the timer.h you can see I am using something called enumerated data types in C. Again those who haven't heard about it please check it. So you enumerated data types they are not creating any new data type. For example here I have written like enumerate timer interfaces capture 0, capture 1, match 0, match 1 etc. So what happens is once I make an enumerated data type like this uh, I'll be able to directly use these identifiers in my code. So entirely what the compiler does is uh, he will give value 0 to this first guy. So wherever I have cap 0, that will be replaced by 0. Wherever I have cap 1, it will be replaced by 1. Wherever I have match 0, it will be replaced by 2, so on and so forth. So he always starts from 0 and goes like that. So here in this example, uh, where I have written like match 0, this match 0 will be actually replaced by this value, which is 0, 1, 2. Same way, enable interrupt. Okay, so that I have written as a different here. So enable interrupt, that value will be replaced by 0, 1. Okay, so if I want to enable interrupt, I want to make that bit 1. That's why I wrote enable interrupt second and disable interrupt first. Okay, so the compiler gives the value 0 to disable interrupt and the value 1 to enable interrupt. If you write it the other way, what happens is uh, when you put enable intra, the corresponding value will be zero. And when you put uh, disable intra, the corresponding value will be one. That's not what you need. In the register, if you want to enable, uh, you want its value to be one. So this order matters in uh, some cases. In some cases, it doesn't matter much. For example, here, uh, here the advantage is instead of uh, saying like zero represents capture 0, 1 represents capture 1 separately. I have put them as a enumerated data type and in my code I am directly using capture 0, capture 1 like that. So the code becomes more intuitive. So try to use this enumerated data types uh, whenever you want to make your code more legible. Now same thing I have used in VAC also. So you will see uh, same style is followed here also. I have the error codes here and the mask and register value this we have seen before. So I know my uh, VIC it supports uh, 32 interrupt channels 
and the what is the order of the interrupt channels it is already known to me okay so if i am hard coding if i want to enable timer zero i'll be passing some parameter uh, saying like four which corresponds to the channel of timer zero now instead of four if i write timer zero directly there uh, for example here you can see enable interrupt i'm passing um, uh, i want to enable some interrupt which interrupt i want to enable i want to enable timer zero interrupt so if you directly write four here still the code will work but it becomes more intuitive more legible if you write timer zero here so again you should be careful when you compare uh, this identifier with the position of the identifier in this enumerated list they should match so here it is zero one two three four they are matching so remember the interrupt channel one is not used still i have written rs there like uh, reserved because if I don't write it there, and if, and if I simply write like this, the problem is wherever timer zero is coming, it will be replaced by zero, one, two, three, and my whole code won't work. So do it carefully, but this will help to more. This will help to make your code more intuitive. Now in the source code of VIC, it is uh, quite similar to how we did it for timer. I have init where I am configuring the base address. In addition to that, I am just disabling all the interrupt and all software interrupts uh, at the beginning uh, whenever it is being initialized now i have a function for enabling interrupt and here again you can see i'm using this boolean operation shift operation to set a particular bit so if it is timer zero i will write timer zero there but after compilation it is like four so it will be effectively one left shifted by four position and everything else will be zero so that is what is I am writing to the uh, VAC interrupt enable register. So same way I have a function to disable interrupt. You can see the logic used there. I am left shifting a one by this source number uh, just like this. But I am taking one's complement of that number. So that will make every bit one except the bit corresponding to this interrupt as one. The bit corresponding to that interrupt will become zero. Then I am adding the current value so this function we have already seen reg right it will add it uh, with that pattern so every bit except the bit corresponding to that interrupt will remain same the bit corresponding to that interrupt will become zero then i am ordering that entire thing with zero okay all clear mask is like all zero all set mask is like all one so try to use these boolean manipulations for efficient code uh, instead of writing all the possible mass and bit values here okay so let's see with all this uh, modification whether our code is still working uh, because that's important so let me compile and run it and you can see like yeah i'm still getting that sign wave okay so everything is working as expected with this modification so the main thing that I wanted to discuss in this tutorial is regarding this interrupt service routine. So in the current example, you can see the interrupt service routine that is written in the main code itself. Okay, so this is the interrupt service routine for the timer when a match operation happens. So this we have already seen. Whenever a match happens, we do calculate this value and we are writing that value to the DAC. Now that function I have modified here. I have a function called convert DAC and all that uh, conversion and shift operation, they are now actually happening inside that function. Okay. So anyway, but the IRQ is still sitting in the main code. Now this is perfectly fine, but in many cases we want to abstract this information also. Okay, so because if you look at my main code now, I have this header file only because I have this IRQ here. All the low level register details I have already abstracted away here. But in this IRQ, uh, you can see I am directly using T0 IR and vector address register inside the VIC. So because of that, I will have to keep this header file here. Okay. otherwise it would have been like complete abstraction now when i commented it out and compiled okay it didn't give error 
because I am including this timer.h, vic.h, dac.h. Uh, which are actually including that header file. That's the only reason why the error didn't happen here. So it will work, but again, from the application software, if you see, I'm still using some of the lower level registry information here. So we may want to abstract away this also. So in certain cases, uh, we prefer to abstract this information also. Okay, so let's see how to do it. Okay, so again, this is important because what happens is when you write a driver uh, for a system with operating system, the current one we are doing, there is no operating system. Uh, we just have a simple loop there, like an operating system. But if you are write drivers for a system with operating system, your interrupt service routine cannot be in the application software. The interrupt service routine should stay in the driver itself. Okay, ISR should be a part of driver not part of application software. Now, what is the problem if I directly put it inside my timer? Okay, so I move my ISR here. These errors you can ignore, it's because like, yeah, we didn't copy the declaration. But the main problem here is, uh, here, what am I doing whenever I am getting an interrupt? I am finding this uh, value for the sign and I am writing it to the DAC. So in a sense, you are constraining what match operation does in your system. Whenever a match operation comes, is just uh, finding some value of a sign curve. But that may not be the case always. You want to use match operation for some other purpose. Okay, Maybe you want to count like how many tablets are there in the bottle, or you want to find like whether a wheel rotated a certain amount of number. So match mode can be used for many purposes, not only for finding the sign value. So if you directly put the entire IRQ here, uh, the issue is you are constraining what your IRQ can do. But no matter which IRQ you write for a match zero, this part, okay, where you are acknowledging the interrupt, where you are acknowledging the interrupt in the VIC, they remain same. Okay, so these two parts uh, will be always there, but this part is not constant. This part uh, may vary. So what we need is we want half of the IRQ or part of the IRQ in the main code and part of the IRQ in the driver. Now that is possible uh, usually with the help of something called callback function. So what we'll do is in the application software we will write a part of the interrupt service routine. We will write it as a function and we will somehow link that function with the actual IRQ. So whenever an interrupt happens, first he will uh, run maybe whatever is in the IRQ at the beginning, then he will run the callback function, whatever we write here. After that, he will continue to run whatever code is in the IRQ. So where your callback function will be uh, running depends upon where you are calling it. So if you are calling your callback here, yeah, first this line will run, then the callback function is called. So that function runs, after that this runs. Okay, so that's what we are trying to implement. So let's see usually how callback functions are uh, done. So that function we will write in the main. Now that, as I mentioned, we need to link it with the IRQ. So usually what we do is, uh, you have the structure which is representing the hardware, which we already have. Here, we will add a pointer to a function. Again, I'm not sure uh, whether you have already seen it before or not. You can have pointers to functions also, and you can make it uh, as a member of a structure. Just like int and float, uh, you have data members, you can have a pointer to a function as data member. So the general syntax is like, uh, you will have return type of that function for which you need to uh, write a pointer, then you will have a pointer, then you will have the list of arguments or parameters that the function takes. So in our case, we are going to write a callback function, which will be ultimately part of an ISR. So its return type will be always void. And this pointer, we can call it by whatever name. Let me call it by callback itself, because it's a callback function. And callback functions, again, like ISR, they don't take any argument. So this is how my callback uh, function looks like.
Next, what I will do is I will write an API using which the application software can link a callback function to my hardware. Okay, so that function, okay, syntax is like normal. You can call it whatever name you want. Let's call it callback, uh, set callback timer, or you can call set callback timer match because we may have different ISRs for each operation. One ISR for match zero, one ISR for match one, one ISR for capture zero. But anyway, I am writing only one now. So let me write it uh, with uh, set callback timer. So of course you will pass that timer structure variable. Along with that, you will pass a pointer to the actual callback function. That actual function we'll be writing in the main and a pointer to that function uh, you will pass here. So here the syntax will be uh, just like this. Okay, so you will be passing a pointer here. Okay, now let's write that function set callback timer, how it looks like. How can you link a pointer to a function with this structure variable? So from here, let me copy the declaration. And this is our T, that's what we have been using. And we can simply say, okay, like any other structure member, you can say like T callback equal to this callback. And you are done. So return success status. Here also you can check whether the timer is actually initialized. Otherwise we won't let the application software to link a callback. Okay, so we are done with the callback function. Now let's go ahead and write the actual callback function. Let me bring back that old IRQ here and we are going to modify. So what I mentioned was, okay, this is standard part of ISR. I don't want this. And this part, I will make it like a callback and it is no longer a complete IRQ. Okay. So now the structure of callback we have already seen. So it will be like return type is void and give some name. Again, you can give whatever name. Let me still call it callback itself and it doesn't take any argument. Okay, so this is our callback. Now we need to link this callback function with the timer variable. So we can do it here uh, after linking or you can do it before also. No issue. So status equal to This one set called back. Okay, our timer is ampersand timer zero here. And here you should pass a pointer to this callback function. So as I mentioned before, the name of a function uh, itself represents the address of the function. So simply writing this is enough and we may check the status also after that and we are done okay so we need to declare it somewhere at the beginning also okay so we declared it now as i mentioned your isr is no longer part of your main code that should be made as a part of the driver so i'm moving the declaration of isr from there to here and i will remove this line from here that name you still need uh, for linking with the VIC. So you can see it here. But since we are using timer.h here, he will be still able to see it. So that won't cause any issue. Maybe this we can rename it as timer match zero ISR. So this is what we are going to use now. So let me add that here. Okay, match zero, I guess. So we wrote the callback. We don't need this one anymore. We wrote the callback. We link the callback with that timer. We move the ISR to the driver. Now you have to write the ISR in the driver. Okay, so let's come here. Okay, so this is what we are going to change. Okay. 
Now within ISA, as I mentioned, uh, this will be always there. Then you need to call your callback function also. Now before that, uh, whenever you write an ISR, usually uh, whenever you get an interrupt, you will disable that interrupt, you will service that interrupt. After that, you will re-enable that interrupt. Okay, so that disabling interrupt, uh, you can either do it at VAC level or you can do it at the peripheral level. That means in case of timer, you can disable the interrupt at timer level or you can disable it at VAC level. But we will prefer to disable it at VAC level because if you disable it at timer level, uh, even if an interrupt happens, interrupt condition happens, uh, it will never reach the interrupt controller. But if you disable it at VAC level, even if that interrupt is disabled in the VAC, uh, still you'll be able to see the raw interrupt status. So later, uh, in some case, if you want to find whether any interrupt condition happened, you can actually find it out. Okay. So we will do the disabling at VAC level. Now the problem with that is you do not have direct access to VAC here because it's the driver for timer. And if this were a normal function, you could have passed the pointer to the VAC to this function. But since this is ISR, he won't take any argument. Especially in this skill, uh, you cannot pass any argument to ISR. If this prefix uh, IRQ is here, you cannot pass anything here. But in certain other systems, whenever an interrupt happens, a pointer to the device which caused the interrupt gets automatically passed to the ISR. Uh, for example, in my other tutorial where we are doing it for uh, Zinc chip, signing SOC, whenever an interrupt happens, a pointer to the peripheral automatically comes to the ISR. Here that is not the case. You do not have direct access to the device. So what I will do is I need to access the VAC. Which VAC? The VAC is sitting in the main. This is where VAC is declared. So what I will do, I will take the same declaration from here and I will put here. Now if you do like this, the problem is you have now two structure variables. Okay, so although their base address, everything will be same. Uh, if you directly put it here, now you will have to initialize it and all. Again, that is not a good practice. What you need is you want to access this VIC from here without it being passed as a function argument. So one way to do it is you put extern here. If you don't put extern here and if you try to compile this, uh, this variable is not representing uh, this VIC. They are totally different but you want them to be one and same. So what you can do is you can put extern here, which basically means uh, this variable is not declared in this file, but it is declared somewhere else. So whenever the compiler compiles this file, uh, he will assume like this is declared somewhere else. And when the linker comes, he will actually link this VIC, uh, this my VIC with this my VIC because here it is written like it is declared somewhere external to the file. Uh, so the linker will find this one and he will link both of them. Now this error will still come, uh, unknown type VIC, because that data type you will have to include here. So I will write like hash include uh, VIC.h here also. So now he should be happy. Okay, so now he is happy. So VIC, we already have a function to disable interrupt, uh, which is this one, disable interrupt. Uh, I will take that and I will pass this address and I want to disable timer zero interrupt. So I will simply pass timer zero there. So it is written timer zero here, you need to Look at the header file here. Okay, it is written timer zero. Okay, so I disabled it. Next, we need to service the interrupt. What are we are supposed to do when an interrupt happens? Where is that sitting? That is sitting here. That is basically this callback function. So we need to call this callback function. So how can we call the callback function? Again, if you need access to this callback function, you need access to this variable because we made callback function as a member of the timer structure. So the pointer to the callback function is actually sitting inside timer zero. So now two approaches are possible. 
one is here again you can type extend timer and whatever is written here timer zero and you can now call that callback function timer zero dot now it is no longer a pointer so we need to use the dot operator and you can just call that function okay so this will call the function which is pointed by the callback variable inside timer zero which is basically this function so this function does okay so if any interrupt happens first we disabled it then that callback function ran after that yes we need to acknowledge the interrupt so these two things happen and after that we need to re-enable that interrupt maybe that we can do just before acknowledging it in the VAC so again we have a function called enable interrupt so we can bring that here and again we can pass these two arguments okay so with this we are done so no errors let's compile and see yeah no error other than this warning we can add a new line and let's debug and see whether it is still working or not Yeah, it is still working. So that callback function linking everything is working fine. Now the only issue with this one is in the timer driver. Okay, here you wrote like extend VIC my VIC. So this means at the time you write the driver for timer itself, you somehow know what will be the variable name given to the VIC. That may not be the case. One same way for this timer zero also you assumed uh, this will be the name given to the timer in the application software now this is a small limitation of c programming if you are doing this with c plus plus it would have worked beautifully in c plus plus your isr will be also becoming a member function inside a class and uh, all the member functions will be able to uh, access all other member functions. that means you can directly access the callback function uh, without doing all this painful thing but here we have the limitation we are in c of course so we have to do something like this so to avoid this issue uh, what you can do is you can force the application software to always use a particular name so what i mean is instead of you assuming the name of the first timer timer zero will be uh, timer zero you can force the application software to use that name so what i will do is instead of making this declaration here as extern I will declare that variable at the top somewhere here and I will remove this extern here this means the timer is now declared inside timer.c now in the main now what you should do because now you have two timer zero here you have to write extern timer zero same way for VIC we will use extern VIC here and this actual VIC we will declare in vic.c file here now we are forcing the application software to use the name my vic always for vic and timer zero for uh, of course timer zero always uh, here for vic it will still remain extra uh, because it is sitting in vic.c now this declaration you should never do it in the header file this one of course uh, either you can find it out by trying what happens if you declare a variable inside a header file uh, that will give error if your header file is included in uh, more than one file uh, if you want details you can search online also why we should not declare any variables inside a header file it should be always declared in the dot c file so if you wish at the top itself we can declare timer zero uh, timer one timer 2 and timer 3 and to the application software guy whoever is writing uh, in the manual we will say like if you want to use timer 0 always use the name timer 0 and he will be always writing it uh, like this extend timer 0 okay so now I don't have to change anything else in my code uh, everything remains same uh, but I just added this callback function feature so I hope uh, this is clear to you. So please try it out. 
uh, with other examples also you can write other callback functions for different operation like for capture or match on one and see like whether you are actually able to do it thank you